All right, everyone, welcome to a candle making q and I'm going to be pulling a list of just questions that I get from all of you on different platforms, uh, YouTube, Facebook groups, asking me different questions regarding candle making, running a small business, and so on. So we're just gonna dive right into this. By the way, I've got a ton of these questions. They come in all the time. So if this type of content or video interests you, where we just go through those questions and start answering things, let me know. I'll just do these videos more often. All right, so let's dive into number one, the shelf life of candles. So that's gonna depend. Uh, there's really no uh, definitive answer there. It's going to depend on the type of candle, the type of wax, but for the most part, a finished candle is pretty safe shelf life. While the shelf life of candles is going to vary, it's not something you have to ultimately be too worried about. For example, if you uh, make some candles in January and they're still setting on your shelves by fall or winter, you're fine. That's totally normal. Once wax and fragrance and all of the materials have kind of combined together, it's a different product. While it is impossible to tell you a specific shelf life of your products, you'll typically know when there's an issue. And really the best way to know that is if they just start to smell rancid. I know this is a very non-scientific answer, but if you noticed your candle is starting to look terrible and smell terrible, then it might be past its shelf life. <laughs> but most candles are gonna last for years. It's not something you really have to worry about, which is actually related to question number two, which is how much I should stock. How many candles should you stock? And a lot of the times this question is asked because they're afraid to stock too many because they don't want them to go bad. Well, we've just touched on that. I really wouldn't worry about stocking too much um, out of concern that they will expire. The other reason this is asked though is people wanna make sure they're stocking enough. They're afraid of not having enough. And again, that is really gonna depend on your business, uh, your objectives, where you're selling, how many options you sell, uh, how long you've been in business, like how many are you selling? And the best way to do that is to look at and monitor your own sales. If you've been in business for a while, you probably have some type of metrics or, or report that you can look at to see how many you're selling uh, per day, per week, per month. And that will give you uh, a pretty good benchmark of what you should be maintaining in stock. If you're a brand new candle maker, then it's gonna depend on how many options you have. The less options you have, you should probably have a little bit more stock. If you have a variety of options, then you can get away with less stock. Let's use an example. If you're a brand new candle maker and you're gonna start with six different fragrances and you have yet to have any sales, you're, you're gonna launch your website, how many should you start with? Again, there's really no right or wrong here, but if it were me and I was starting a brand new business uh, with no marketing, no sales, nothing, just out of the gate, wanted to start with some candles. I'd probably start with, I don't know, eight to 10 of each fragrance and then do my best to sell those. And if I start seeing any momentum and see, start seeing any of those candles moving, then I know which to make more of next. So early on, it's just about watching your sales and, and letting that guide you on, on how much more you should be making. Now, one thing to consider is the type of material you're using. So some waxes do need uh, more time to quote unquote cure and let your candles develop its fragrance before you sell them. And so if you're using one of those waxes where it takes longer, then you might wanna start with more initial stock, which also naturally means that if you start getting lower on stock, then you wanna make that stock a little bit sooner. If you're using materials that do not need that much time, then uh, you have more margin for error, in other words. All right, number three, how to gather feedback from test groups. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I highly encourage using test groups and um, customers to give you some feedback early on, really all the time, but especially early on. I would basically create a, a feedback form that you provide to your feedback testers and your feedback groups. And on this form, you can have all sorts of different things that you want them to rate or give you feedback on. So one thing I would have them provide feedback on is your cold throw, which of course is the, the strength of your fragrance before it's lit. And I would say, have them judge this basically from six feet away from your candle up to over top of your candle. You want an idea of how strong your candle smells before anyone actually lights it. Maybe do this on a scale of like one to five, three being average, five is great, one is weak. And then do the same thing with hot throw. In other words, you want them to give you feedback on that same scale of one to five, maybe after one hour, two hours, and then let's say four hours. Whatever you go with, again, just make sure that that uh, scoring system, that rating system is consistent across your entire feedback group. Also have them rate your appearance. So put them in a situation, if they were to see your candle on a shelf at a store, what would they think? And uh, maybe give them again, a same scale of one to five, five being a great appearance, three being average and one, but also you need specific notes on this, on this factor. Um, you wanna know specifically what they like about the appearance, what they don't like about the appearance. What would grab their attention more? What would they recommend changing? Maybe suggestions to the label, the color, and so on. Ask them also on the bottom of this, would they purchase this candle again? That's a very, very important question to ask customers. It's important to get customers to purchase your candle for the first time. 
but it's just as, if not more important, to get your customers to purchase again. You want repeat customers. So just ask them, would you buy this candle again? And if not, why? And do not make them feel guilty or bad. You want honest, real feedback. And just let them know that you're trying to improve your products. So you want honest, transparent feedback. And then also ask them about pricing. Did they think it was a good value? Would they have paid more? And if so, how much? So anyways, that's just a small uh, sample of things that you could be asking, but those are things that would certainly be on my list to ask my feedback group. All right, next question is, uh, Wick is too small at Tom but if I wick up in mushrooms. Yeah, so this is that uh, that that funny range of, of when you're testing your wicks where it feels like if, uh, if you go any lower, the candle's just gonna tunnel and it's not gonna burn correctly. But if you go any higher, the wick seems too big. Uh, it mushrooms, the flame's too tall. If you're ever in one of those situations where it feels like you just can't get the right size, well, then it's usually time to try a new wick type. Different wick types work better in different applications. And so it's not all just about sizing. You might wanna try a different wick type. Most of the time with whatever wax you're using, a single wick type is gonna get you by for the majority of situations. You might have to adjust the sizing a little bit, but that wick type is usually going to suffice. However, there's gonna be times where, like I said, uh, the wick size, you just can't get dialed in and it might be time to try a different wick type. Now, I do wanna say that uh, there tends to be a little bit too much apprehension towards mushrooms on wicks. A lot of people just freak out and think that uh, if, if I got any mushroom at all on the wick, any carbon buildup at all, that it's a failed test. That is just not true. It's not the case at all. Some mushroom, I mean, a little bit of a mushroom cap or carbon buildup is totally normal and you can't prevent it all the time. There might be some burns where you have none at all and then you have one that does develop a little bit of a mushroom and the next burn, it's back to none at all. We're talking about a very complex combustion process going on with a candle. It's not gonna be perfect or consistent all the time. Go ahead and embrace that now. Uh, you'll save yourself a lot of headache later. Uh, what you don't want is a large mushroom after one or two hours and it's happening on every single burn and it's kicking soot and throwing smoke everywhere uh, and you're getting way too deep of a melt pool, that's an indication of a problem. But a little bit of a mushroom is totally normal. So I wouldn't worry about that so much. Speaking of which, what makes the wicks that you sell different from others? So uh, actually that's a, that's a great follow-up question because uh, what, what that question is referring to is I use mostly Premier 700 series wicks in most of my products. And if you're unaware, I sell those now as a distributor on my website. You can go to blacktiebarn.com, click on makers, or click on four makers, and under there you'll see a, a link to those wicks. The reason I use those wicks so much is to help combat the issue that we just talked about. Because that wick series has so many incremental sizes, there's 29 different sizes in that wick series. And it really helps you dial in that exact precise sizing. So it's much easier to find a wick that works in your application. Now, like all wicks, there's going to be waxes they work great for and certain waxes they might not work as good for. But one of the best things about this wick series is that it works in the majority of wax types. It's one of the most universally useful wick series is in my opinion. That's why I've used them for so long and that's why I now sell them. You can check more information out on the website if you're interested in learning more about them, but they are a uh, cotton wick. They've got a great natural looking color. Uh, and again, very versatile wick with tons of different sizes. I also sell a sample pack if you're not sure where to start. All right, how do I determine how much fragrance oil, wax, and dye? Um, well, that's sort of a loaded question. Uh, I think basically the question's asking how do you develop a recipe? <laughs> uh, the short answer is testing, uh, but there's great starting points. Uh, most waxes will tell you how much fragrance it can hold. And then of course, just depending on the size of candle you're making, that gives you uh, a starting point of how much total product you need. So let's say you're making a candle that is a 10 ounce candle. Well, then essentially you need 10 ounces total of wax and fragrance oil. So then you just need to figure out what percentage of fragrance oil you want. And that's gonna depend on how strong you want your candle to be, the type of wax you're using, um, the quality of the fragrance oil. And it's basically just an equation, one math formula. And it's very simple. If you want a 10% fragrance load, then you're gonna take the amount of wax you're using times 10%. And then you just add them together and that's your total fill. Now, I don't wanna get into all the weeds and details on that in, in this short video, but I have a great video, not being modest, that you should check out when it comes to figuring this out. Uh, it will tell you exactly how to do it. And there's two methods to do it. One of them I prefer over the other, but check out that video. It will walk you through and make this so much easier for you going forward. And there are resources out there that help you figure this out for you, like online fragrance calculators and so on. But if you just watch that video and learn to do it yourself, 
It's so much better because it makes you uh, be able to adjust on the fly a lot easier and you don't have to rely on one of these um, fragrance calculators to do it for you. So uh, check out that video. I will have it linked in the description. All right, the secret to good colors. Your colors are always so fantastic and vibrant. Uh, well, thank you for starters. Uh, I do take a lot of pride in colors. Um, I do sell both. I sell vessels that have undyed candles and then I obviously sell candles that are colored. And the secret to good colors is really a few things. One is good materials. Uh, most of your candle suppliers are going to sell good quality dyes. And uh, so I don't necessarily think it matters so much where you get them from, uh, but I would stick with one and test those. And if you're not happy with the results, then you could try something else. The two biggest factors, though, that are going to lead to good colored candles, experience and testing, and your wax type. So let's start with experience and testing. The more you do it, the more you experiment with colors, the better you're going to get at it. And that's how I learned. I had, I started with a color fragrance wheel, which I think there's one in the description below if you want to check it out. And it just gives you a, a good way to like figure out mixing different colors, what kind of color hue it's going to give you. And so uh, that'll help get you started. But the more you do this, you just get good at it. And, and uh, you experiment and you try different colors, different combinations, and you figure out what colors that work well together. And if you mix these different colors, what happens? You just get good at it through experience and practice. When I am making test candles, I always use color because it's a good opportunity to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. And so if I'm gonna spend time testing, I might as well experiment with colors at the same time. And then the other thing that's really important for getting good colors is your wax type. Some waxes will produce much more vibrant colors than others, and others are gonna create more kind of pastel colors. And so if you're having a hard time getting really rich, vibrant colors, it's probably your wax type. Soy waxes tend to have more of a pastel, muted color. Uh, and then some of your paraffins and your coconut candles are going to have more rich, vibrant colors. Now that's a very general rule, but it's a good baseline. Uh, now one important note about coloring your candles and working with dye, be sure that if you are taking a candle that you normally did not use any dye with, and then you want to start coloring that candle, make sure you retest because dye can affect wicking, especially if you're using a lot. So my advice is use the least amount of dye possible that you can get away with it. Uh, and then if you're going to continue to add more, be sure to your testing as you go, because it, it is another part of that recipe. It's like fragrance oil, any additives, anything that are added to your entire blend, uh, can potentially affect wicking. Speaking of wicking, what are my thoughts on wickless testing? All right, I have a video on this topic specifically and I plan to do another one, but my general answer to this is I'm not a huge fan of it. I understand the advantages of it and I understand why people really wanna do it because it can save you some money and materials. And the idea of wickless testing, if you are brand new, is that you make a candle without a wick, you poke a hole in the middle once the candle is set and then you just insert a wick and if uh, and you test it. If it doesn't work, you can pull it out and put in a new one. In theory, it makes perfect sense. And again, I totally understand. However, it leads to very, very unreliable results, at least in my experience and many other people that I've worked with. The problem is, is that wick is not attached to the bottom. So even if it looks like the wick is in there and standing straight, you don't know for sure. And because it becomes soft underneath and it's not adhered to the bottom, it is starting to lean and move even just a little bit is going to start making that wick sag or sink down a little bit. So what happens is it leads to a lot of makers thinking that their candle is under wicked because the, the flame is small, it's drowning out, it doesn't seem like it's a big enough wick. So they keep wicking up and wicking up. Then when they produce a final candle where the wick is actually attached to the bottom, the wick is oversized. And so I do not like to rely on something that I'm not confident in. And so my advice would be, if you are going to do wickless testing, start with it, but be sure to verify. I, I normally would say trust and verify. I, I don't even trust it. Verify, verify. Uh, remake finished candles uh, properly and make sure that you actually are getting consistent results like you thought you were. Sometimes everything will check out fine. Many times it won't. And the fact that I'm... I'm never gonna be sure confident is why I don't like to do wickless testing. That's my own opinion on that, um, but uh, not, not a huge fan of it, to be honest. If you are a brand new candle maker and you're very limited on the uh, materials you can use to test with, then perhaps start with a, a few candles, no wicks, insert it, get a really good uh, idea up front. Like if you have no idea where to start on a wick, you're brand new, um, then yeah, it makes sense to maybe start with something and see You'll know in the first 30 minutes, an hour, if your candle wick is way undersized or way oversized. Uh, and then once you get a little bit more experience and an idea range of a wick, then I would not do wickless testing anymore. I would just make three or four candles at a time, 
with your range of wicks that you know are close and then choose the best one. Um, but again, that's once you have some general experience on your, on your wicks that you're using. All right, so for the last one for today is any tips on bookkeeping and taxes for a small business uh, like candle making? That's not something we can cover in, in one video. So yes, the answer is I have uh, lots of information I could share on that. Um, I enjoy that topic, believe it or not. And I think the best way to answer this is I get this question all the time all the time. So I've been considering doing some more like live classes with small groups. And uh, I know there's a lot of people interested in that. So I think it's much more productive if we have a smaller group, like 12 people at a time. So stay tuned, subscribe to the channel. I'm going to post some information um, on this here on the channel, also in the Facebook group, also in the newsletter below. Sign up for the Candlemaker newsletter below and in the description of this video. And I will share when I uh, plan to start doing that. And I'm going to start doing that soon, I think. And maybe what we'll do is I'll go ahead and schedule a couple of them uh, that we do live uh, through a Zoom or something like that. And then uh, if, if they fill up and there's a lot of interest, then I'll just do more of them. <laughs> so if that does interest you and you really want some more information and maybe some tips on how to do um, you know small business bookkeeping, how to handle your taxes, how to handle your inventory uh, and all of that, then just let me know. And uh, if I get enough interest in that, I will definitely get that going. This actually went a little bit longer than I intended, but uh, I I am interested if you guys are and maybe doing these more periodically, where we just take a you know a, a chunk of questions at a time and just kind of hit them like this. And so if you liked this, if you enjoy this content, let me know and we'll keep doing more. Thanks for tuning in as always, and hope you guys enjoy this video. Please subscribe, give this video a thumbs up, and I'll see you next time.